and the shorter season, it's going to get faster and faster for us because you break your fast around 5.30. So you realize that Ramadan is going too fast, subhanAllah. And I think, Shaykhna, uh, that is a very interesting observation right now with what we discussed last night. So last night we were talking about the delusion of safety. You know, how people, they have excuses to keep procrastinating for tawbah and keep extending their life with sins and mistakes and, and, and faults and errors and justifying it to themselves. Okay. They're justifying this to themselves, but of course, with saying astaghfirullah will be okay, making wudu and just do tawbah, to rak'ah will be fine, and, and saying, you know, Allah is the most merciful, many, many excuses. So there's that delusion of safety, and now we are almost done with the month of Ramadan, yes, and we still think, I still have time. Yes, I mean, Laytul Qadr maybe still on the 27, right? So I still have time. That's also delusion of safety. So right. remind us of what happened last night. So, alhamdulillah, uh, you know, last night we, we spoke in detail sort of about this idea of not having a false hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Mm. What the scholars mentioned of the difference between husn al in Allah and ghurur, right? So a good expectation of Allah versus you know, delusion, the delusion of the self. And Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah is going to go into the disease. So for the next few nights, we're spending time with the disease, and of course, we'll allude to the cure along the way. But the believer, if they have more fear than hope in terms of their own deeds, they should be more interested in the sections that talk about the disease than the sections that talk about the hope, because I mm -hmm. want to really get the diagnosis right. So this is one section, Sheikh, from, from yesterday. I, if you don't mind, can I read it before sure, we sure. go into today? Because I feel like it bridges, subhanAllah, everything from, from last night to this one. Uh, he said, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, يَتْبَعُ الذَّنْبَ أَعْظَمُ مِنَ الذَّنْبِ إِذَا عَمِلْتَهُ That what follows the sin is something greater than the sin when you do it. So he says, قِلَّةُ حَيَائِكَ مِمَّنْ عَلَى الْيَمِينِ وَعَلَى الشِّمَالِ So he says that the shamelessness that you have with those that are to your right and to your left will enter على them أعظم من الذم. Worse than the sin is your shamelessness of committing that sin in front of the person that's to your right and to your left or the angel on your right or your left. وضحكك وأنت لا تدري ما الله صانع بك أعظم من الذم. And when you laugh carelessly and you don't know what Allah is going to do with you, that's greater than the sin itself. You know, when you see the Prophet ﷺ, he's described as smiling and laughing. But there is a laughter that's condemnable in Islam. By the way, Shaykh, I'm, I'm going to say this, uh, subhanAllah, when Shaykh taught Prophet Smile. How many of you took Prophet Smile? Oh man, you need to teach it again, Shaykh. Shamal Muhammadiyah, the Shamal of the Prophet are majestic. Because to learn the attributes of the Prophet is to give you a standard in the finer details of your life. And uh, I used to always say that Shaykh Yasir, mashallah, he smiles and laughs the way that the Shamal described. Because Sheikh Yasser doesn't make, I'm serious. <laughs> yeah, see, let me, I wanted to do that on purpose. You know why? Have you ever heard Sheikh Yasser have a hearty laugh, like really laugh out loud? Maybe no. at home, yeah. Maybe. maybe at home, right? <laughs> but there's a type of laughter that's actually, uh, and may Allah protect you, Sheikh. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make you, you, make you sincere Amin. and make us sincere. And all of us, I mean, but there's a laughter that you'll find the Prophet upset about people laughing. And it's like, but he also used to laugh. There's a laughter of carelessness and recklessness, like as if nothing matters and, and as if, you don't really take anything seriously, like a boastful laugh that's condemnable by the Prophet like Sallallahu As if they have bridge, crossed over the bridge of Dawah Jahannam. Yeah, 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 like that, like LOLing, literally laughing out loud in, in real life um, is something that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi would not have liked when he saw someone doing that. So he says here, for you to laugh like that and you don't know where Allah is going to put you is worse than the sin itself. And he continues and he says, um, the happiness that you get out of committing the sin is worse than the sin itself. And your sadness over the sin, if you fail to commit it, is worse than the sin itself. Meaning mm -hmm. it's like you wanted to commit a sin and you had the intention, but just circumstantially you weren't able to commit the sin and then you were sad that you missed out on it. That's worse than committing the sin itself. And finally he says, And he said that your fear, if the wind starts to blow on your door and you feel like you're about to be exposed committing the sin, 
while you were not afraid or you were not giving any due to the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon you the whole time while you were committing that sin is worse than the sin itself. So it's not about the material of the sin. It's about what the sin represents and what the sin affects. So when they say underlying causes of the disease, right? And the broader implications of the disease. This is what the scholars would talk about. Like, hey, uh, as Imam Ahmed rahimahullah would say, or he heard the poem, إِذَا مَا قَالَ لِي رَبِّي أَمَا اسْتَحْيَيْتَ تَعْصِينِ وَتُخْفِ الزَّنْبَ عَنْ خَلْقِي وَبِالْعُسْيَانِ تَأْتِينِ That I'm afraid my Lord will say to me, weren't you afraid? Or, you know, uh, weren't you shy of disobeying me? تُخْفِ الزَّنْبَ عَنْ خَلْقِي Like you hide it from other people, وَبِالْعُسْيَانِ تَأْتِينِ But when you look around and you don't see anyone around, you have no issues. Like you don't even have a guilty conscience anymore with the sin. And so the idea here is pay attention to the effects of the sin, both on the heart, and I think this is how we phase into this chapter, Sheikh. Mm -hmm. it, how you sin tells you about how you see Allah. Mm -hmm. How you really feel about Allah. Like, you just don't take Allah that seriously if you only think about sin in terms of weighing the worldly risk and worldly pleasure. Like, once you know that Allah is watching you, and once you start to come into a relationship with Allah, then even before you learn something is haram, it doesn't feel right. It, it tastes bad. It, it doesn't feel right. Something is not sitting right with me about this. And your ethics, your fitrah, your natural disposition will start to be one that's pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to where you'll be guided towards good, subhanAllah, and then you'll confirm it when you realize that this is haram or this is halal. So sinning brazenly cannot coincide with true husn al in Allah. That's what I want you to understand. You can't have hope in Allah while you sin brazenly. Instead, you should focus on the names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that could strike fear and wake you up to the reality of your Lord who is watching you. I believe this is also similar to what you said last night when we talked about uh, how should you consider the sin? Is it major sin, minor sin? Because people, they keep really trying to find ways, also like we said, delusion of safety. Like, how big the sin was anyway? Like, even when you tell them this is wrong, they, come, they combat that statement with saying, how, how big of a mistake was that? How, how, how much is that sin is considered? Is it major sin, minor sin? Uh, is it, you know, uh, uh, haram, haram, or haram? They try to find a way to, to get out of it uh, because they're focusing on the action itself, right. not on against whom the action has been committed. Right. And that's why the ulama, they say, don't you ever look how small or tiny or little that sin that you've committed was. But look at how great against that sin has already been committed. And if you do so, and if you do so, no sin will ever be minor in your eyes. If you think of the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, no sin will ever be considered minor in your eyes. But unfortunately, with that delusion that since we learned, we have actually major and minor, and so therefore, alhamdulillah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Some people have that delusion as well, too. Is that, look, Allah says, if you avoid the major sins, we're going we're gonna to overlook your minor sins. So for them, they think it's okay then to do a lot of minor sins as long as I'm not doing the, the big, big haram things. That's also a problem because now we're focusing on the action itself. Right. We're not really focusing on against whom that action has been committed. And subhanAllah, uh, a salaf of Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala, they used to say um, that al -mathal munafiq wal -mu'min, the difference between a hypocrite and a believer is that uh, a, a hypocrite, no matter how big his sins are, he thinks of it as being just like a fly that lands on his nose and he just shoot away with his hand. That's it. This is how simple it is to get out, the, just stay away from it or just push it away from you. But for the believer, no matter how little their sins are, they always think of them like a boulder or like a mountain about to fall on top of them, no matter how little that is. But I also want to give a message of hope so that people don't feel that, you know what, if this is the case, then I'm doomed. Alhamdulillah, our ulama, they also, say, they also say, there is no sin considered too big when you compare this to what? The mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So to myself, I always have su'ul dhan, like I always have bad assumption about myself. But with Allah, I always have husnul dhan ma Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, good assumption about Allah azza wa jal. Shaykh, tonight inshallah ta'ala we're going to be talking about what are consequences of these sins. And some people they would say, alhamdulillah, I'm still having a good life. 
yeah, yeah, look at me, mashallah, my job is good, my marriage is good, my life is good, so that means Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is radin anni, he's pleased with me. But truly, what is the, the subtle effect of sins that people don't pay attention to that can be detrimental for them in the dunya before the akhirah? So Imam Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala, he says, قال, وللمعاصي من الآثار القبيحة والمذمومة والمضرة بالقلب والبدن في الدنيا والآخرة ما لا يعلمه إلا الله He goes, sins, they have these effects the, the ills of sins obviously, they have these effects مضرة uh, بالقلب that it hurts the heart, the body, in this dunya and in the akhira effects that only Allah knows how dangerous they are and he mentioned few of them, we're going to share a few of them with you tonight inshallah ta'ala Number one, and so ironically, Shaykh Subhanallah, out of all the sins, mm -hmm. all, the, all the effects, he chose something very profound. He called one minha, hermanul ilm, to being deprived of knowledge. Now, قال فإن العلم نور يقذفه الله في القلب والمعصية تطفي ذلك النور. He goes because this knowledge is light; it illuminates and shines the heart. Like Allah Subhanahu wa Taala throws that light into the heart of the believer, والمعصية. As for the sin, what does it do? It goes and actually extinguishes that light, turns it off completely. Now, before people start you know, wondering about what's the meaning of, of ilm over here, because I know some people might think, they think of ilm as holding books and reading and so on. So, no, I still read books. I still come to these halaqat. I always listen to Sheikh Omar. I watch this whole series in the Ramadan and so on. So, like, I am still, you know, pursuing knowledge. So, you, you can't say that I'm being deprived of knowledge. No, there's a big difference between having the information and having the effect of that information on you. That's what real knowledge is. Our ulama, they say, قال العلم, العلم لا ما تقرأ بل ما تحفظ. Knowledge is not what you read, it's what you memorize. But then some ulama, they said, no, 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 that's not true. قال العلم, العلم ما تفهم لا ما تحفظ. Knowledge is what you truly understand. Now we just memorize. And then some ulama said, wait a minute, that's not it. Still. He goes, لا, قال العلم ما تعمل لا ما تفهم. Knowledge, true knowledge, is what you, what you act on, what you practice, not what you understand. Because uh, each and every one of us right now, if I ask you to write me uh, something on the virtue of sadaqah, the virtue of tahajjud and qiyamul layl, you're going to give me a volume. But how many of us practice that to begin with? That's when it becomes now more effective or otherwise. So therefore, ilm, Shaykh, is extremely important. Without yeah. it, that heart dies out. Can, There's no light in it. Uh, Shaykh Tahir Wyatt mm. once said something beautiful. <laughs> he said, There's a, some people know about Allah, but they don't know Allah. True. You can know about Allah without actually knowing Allah. Subhanahu Subhanahu Allah. Allah. And yeah. that was a powerful yeah. way to put it. Um, and the ulama talk about this. Jahilun billah, aliun bi ahkami. Someone who's ignorant of Allah, but that knows his rulings. Um, and, and this is something prominent. Look, uh, the idea here is that the sweetest gift that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can give you is a constant relationship with Him. And you can't make dua with jahl. You can't make dua with ignorance because you don't know who you're calling upon, the nature of the one you're calling upon, what you're going to ask Him for. You can't read Quran with ignorance because you don't know what you're even trying to extract. But a person who's in the pursuit of knowledge is like a person, so you know, the image of the person who makes dua is like the one who's in the water saying, Ya Rab, Ya Rab, Oh my Lord, Oh my Lord. The image of a true seeker of knowledge is someone who feels like there is disease in everything until I learn of how to cure that particular thing with what the medicine that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives is. So there is ilm that treats the jahl. And there's a reason why the era before Islam is called what? Al-Jahiliyyah, the era of ignorance. Islam came with knowledge, it was the era of ignorance because people from their idol worship to their personal lives to their community lives, they weren't even thinking about how to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with this. The Sahaba were the opposite of those people in Jahiliyyah, even though they were the same human beings, the same mm -hmm. physical beings, but when their hearts were cured, like they're thinking about Allah with the smallest of transactions. So when they're asking the Prophet Sallallahu about this and about that. They're asking with the intention to apply. And that is how you judge your sincerity. Do you ask with the intention to apply? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gifts that to the sincere believer, mm. even if the believer does not mm. memorize so much. And I wanted to say this yesterday, by the way, 
You know, Imam Ahmed, um, you know, there were some people that were mocking um, a, a person at his time that wasn't a great scholar, but he was, he was you know, a true zahid. Uh, he was someone who was an ascetic. He was someone who was really just a righteous person, simple person. And Imam Ahmed, rahimahullah, he said that he already has the fruit of knowledge. إِنَّمَا يَخْشَ اللَّهَ مِنْ عِبَادِهِ الْعُلَمَاء those who truly have awe of Allah are the learned ones. He has true awe of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He has that. And so let me tell you, there are a lot of people in the world that you could sit in front of and you could quote more ahadith than them. I'll go a step further. There are people in Gaza that are standing in front of the cameras inspiring the world right now with their faith that if they sat at lunch or dinner with you, you would know more than them. Some of them, you would know more than them. But you don't know Allah like they know Allah. Mm. So true knowledge is a light in the heart that clarifies everything around you. And sin, it, it's like having that flashlight and throwing a bunch of dirt on it. Sin doesn't allow you to see anymore. You can't see no. clearly. So you can't study properly, nor can you retain properly, nor can you act properly. Sheikh, uh, subhanAllah, the difference between our generation and generations from the past. Today we have access to information. Like in your pocket, if you have a cell phone and you have access to the Wi-Fi or the internet, you have access to billions of pages of knowledge in different languages. But how much of this knowledge that you have handy in your pocket right now, you really can retain or even can express without having to go and open that phone and try, try to read from there? Back in those days, people didn't have the luxury of carrying with them this much knowledge in their pockets. So if you're going to have to carry something with you, it's going to be parchments, which means huge volumes. And if you're going to be traveling for seeking knowledge, how many books can you carry with you anyway? Not much. So what do they have to do in order for them to be able to save that knowledge? They memorize it. That's why people are encyclopedias of knowledge. They memorize tons of books. Okay, how many books do you have to memorize? Not much really. Like some of the ulama, only just if they memorize one book of hadith, that is sufficient. They become scholars. Why? Because now they practice what they've memorized and what they've learned. But a lot of us, they know tons of ahadith and tons of books of uloom and so on, and we pursue seeking knowledge for years. But if you ask about the ratio of how much we practice of this, there is nothing, not much. So there is no barakah in this. And that's for people who are not even committing sins. Imagine those who are committing sins right now. How much of that barakah will be, even, uh, uh, be gone? So it become like completely wasted. And subhanAllah, uh, another thing about the difference between our knowledge and their knowledge is that their knowledge comes in the form of adab. Like the practice of that knowledge comes in the manner and the, the refinement of character. Because that's the whole purpose of that knowledge. A tazkiyah, as Allah mentioned that in the Quran. The purpose of the deen is to do tazkiyah to the people. And that's why Ibn Qayyim, rahimahullah, he mentioned this as the appropriation of knowledge, meaning the effect of it in their lives. Abdullah Mubarak, rahimahullah, says, قال, نحن أحوجو uh, minna ila, ila minna ila La, we need just a little bit of adab, way more than we need so much knowledge. Like that's why you, you mentioned, Shaykh, some people they were just would be probably illiterate. They don't even know how to read and write, probably. But subhanAllah, when you sit with them, they teach you volumes. Yeah. Volumes of adab, akhlaq, manners, and not just that, even connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Like, I have to bring that, subhanAllah, a moment of, of truth to see how people can be connected to Allah Azza wa because they have the profound knowledge, not the information, the profound knowledge. When I remember there was a video we came viral at some point in the, in the past few years, when a guy was driving his fancy SUV in the desert, and the AC was, mashallah, running and so on, and then he stops by uh, a, a shepherd in the desert, a Sudanese shepherd in the desert. And uh, so he came to him, he goes, uh, he goes, uh, Salaam Alaikum. And he gave him basically a bottle of water. And then he asked him after, he says, do you need anything? Do you need anything? This man, if you look at his, how he looked, what he was doing, uh, where he was staying, complete desert, disheveled, dusty, dressed, not so good. But when he was asked, do you need anything? What did he say? Qala alhamdulillah, wallahi nahnu fi zihamin min al-ni'am. That was the first time I've ever heard that expression. He says, Alhamdulillah, we have like traffic jam of blessings. Like the blessings are coming down, that we have traffic jam of this. Like there's so much that the blessings are coming in abundance that we, we can't even hold everything, subhanAllah. 
what does it really have? But that statement is a profound knowledge. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, مَنْ عِبَادِ الْعُلَمَاءِ Truly, those who fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are mindful of Allah, as I would say. Those who are truly mindful of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the most amongst you are those who have that profound knowledge. May Allah make us a mother, ya Rabbil Alameen. Naam. The second point, Shaykh. قَالُ وَمِنْهَا From the effect uh, of, uh, of sins, and unfortunately, ill effects of sins. قَالُ وَمِنْهَا حِرْمَانُ الرِّزْقِ That a person will be deprived of provision and rizq. Like something that was supposed to happen to you because of the sin, subhanAllah, it goes away. قَالُ وَفِي الْمُسْنَدِ إِنَّ الْعَبْدَ لَيُحْرَمُ الرِّزْقَ بِالذَّنْبِ يُصِيبُ وَقَدْ تَقَدَّمْ He says in his hadith, which was reported earlier from Hadith Thawban, that the Prophet ﷺ says, إِنَّ الْعَبْدَ لَيُحْرَمُ الرِّزْقَ بِالذَّنْبِ يُصِيبُ Someone, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, could deprive a person from a rizq that was supposed to go to them because of a sin that they commit. Some that they've committed, that would make them lose a rizq. Let me give an example. You were supposed to wake up at 6 o'clock in the morning because you have an important meeting that would probably maybe land you in a, your dream job. But you decided to waste your time at night watching something inappropriate. And then what happens? You miss that meeting because you wake, awake all night. Or maybe because maybe you did walk, wake up for that uh, uh, meeting. But guess what? You're cranky because you only spend you know, two hours or three hours of sleep. So no, you don't, you're not focused. And when you speak, you're on the edge because you're sleepy. And you can imagine the consequences, the effects, because everything has asbab, means. So it's not like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to cut off that rizq. No, your sin is going to cause you to follow certain asbab, certain means that will make that risk go away from you. That is how, how serious this matter is, a jama'ah. Qala, wa kama anna taqwa Allahi majlabatun lirrizq. Just like being mindful of Allah, conscious of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, fear Allah azza wa jal, brings risk to you, as Allah says in the Quran, qal, um, wa ma yattaqi Allah yaj'al lahu makharaja wa arzuqhu min haythu la yahtasib. Whoever is mindful of Allah, whoever fears Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah will give them exit out of every difficulty. And will provide for them from sources they don't account for. Like that rizq has come from everywhere. SubhanAllah. If you avoid taqwa, if you abandon taqwa, and you know, become mindless of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's going to bring you poverty. Right. Losing a lot of opportunities for rizq. He says, subhanAllah, no better way of seeking more provision and more rizq and increase in your prosperity than avoiding sins. Like avoid sins, your rizq is going to start coming in abundance. May Allah subhanahu make us among those who receive it in abundance, Ya Rabbil Alameen. This is uh, one of the most important points, I think, to elaborate on that someone might look around and they'll say, yeah, but this person acts horribly, but the risk is endless for them. It seems like the sustenance mm. is endless for them. That person's sustenance is not coming as a result of their sin. Mm. That person's sustenance is coming as a result of a test, right? Whereas another person has taqwa and the doors of risk are not opening up to them. The taqwa is not bringing about poverty for them the tests and tribulations that Allah is sending them is a means of elevating them. Mm. It's coming from the hub, from the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the point here, that a person should never attribute, so, so this is where it can become really bad. A person should never feel like something bad happened to them because of something good they did for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's when this becomes super dangerous for you, mm. right? I did something righteous and then I was deprived. Absolutely not. Nothing that comes to you of good comes except through your taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the absolute sense. And nothing that comes to you of bad comes to you except in the absolute sense through disobedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But sometimes, and this is the divine decree, because otherwise if it was just a matter of, hey, if I go to the masjid, my bank account immediately starts, like I'm going I'm to see the, I'm going to see it, right? So when you hear the hadith about spend in charity and then, ya ibn Adam, anfiq, anfiq alayk, spend and I'll spend on you. So, you know, you immediately swipe the credit card, then you go home and like you got twice as much money. It doesn't work that way. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's plan of risk, because you know what else is like risk? I'm sorry, I just got to do this. <laughs> it's not just money. <laughs> Allah sustains you from multiple pathways, for multiple reasons, for things that have been done in the past or things that might be d d done in the future. 
in ways you can't put all together. So it's not, there's no instantaneous reaction here. But the believer has full yaqeen, has full certainty that when I do good, Allah will send me good as a result of that. Either in this life or the next or both. And when I do bad, it will catch up to me. And it will breed poverty and punishment either in this life or the next. And as Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah is pointing out here, at the very least, the numbers might grow, but there is going to be absolutely no blessing in what is given to you. No. And so there will be spiritual poverty even in material wealth. There will be loneliness even in great social company. You're going to feel the effect of that sin and that's why it's important that he keeps on building up on the consequences of sin. It's not, it's not a quantity thing here. We're not a people who deal with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in quantity. Again, that's the prosperity doctrine. That's not how we are as Muslims. Mm. There are rich people, wealthy people that have very little money. But they yeah. are wealthy, wealthy, wealthy people. And there are people that are flat out broke. Mm. And they have a lot of money, but they are so broke. And on the Day of Judgment, they'll even be more bankrupt when they show up at the Mizan, when they show up at the scale. May Allah Azza not make us amongst them. SubhanAllah, I don't want to um, allude to this in the Arabic uh, uh, language. There are two words that express uh, prosperity. There is Ghani and Thari. Mm. So there is Ghina and there is Tharwa. Mm. So um, you said Tharwa, it means abundance. So uh, when you say someone has a lot of, uh, a lot of money, uh, a lot of properties, we say Thari. But not every Thari is Ghani, meaning rich. Not every Thari is Ghani. You might have the houses, you might have the properties, the money, the cars, everything you can dream of. But you always feel dependent on it. You always feel dependent on your manager, your accountant, your this, your that, the market, the economy, the opportunities. You're always dependent on that, so you are never rich. You're only rich when you become self-sufficient. That's why the, the word ghina is actually being self-sufficiency, that you don't depend on anybody. This is why one of the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is what? Al-Ghani, not al thari Al-Ghani, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is absolutely self-sufficient, doesn't need anybody. So you might have all the money of the world, but you're not Ghani. You're still not rich. You're still poor. You have poverty in your heart. It doesn't matter how much you get. So stop trying to pursue prosperity through money and positions and so on. That doesn't make you rich. But if you can really find that richness and that sense of being rich in your heart, it doesn't matter how little stuff you have in your heart, your hands, subhanAllah, you will feel, you'll feel always great. As it's in the Arabic poetry, إِذَا مَا كُنْتَ ذَا قَلْبٍ قَنُوعٍ فَأَنْتَ وَمَالِكُ الدُّنْيَا سَوَاءُ If you, if you have a content heart, then you and the one who possess the whole world are equal. What matters if you eat, I don't know, just two dollars maybe worth of breakfast meal and you're so satisfied with it or you eat a hundred dollars buffet meal and you're still you know satisfied as well too you're both gonna have that satisfaction anyway so that's something I wanted to bring to our attention inshallah ta'ala the other thing though I need to solve the whole problem with the romance is risk I have to solve this issue right now so I want to make it very clear to you guys look romance is not necessarily risk from that context what is risk is hub love because the prophet sallallahu says what about khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha qala inni rizqtu hubbaha i was given that risk of her love no. whether it means that she loved him or that he loved her i believe it's both because he loved khadija sallallahu alayhi wa and she loved him as well too so he was given that love for her he was it was like provision and what's the purpose what's the purpose of provision in jama'a you live on it you, you thrive on, on that risk. So for him, his life, he was thriving with that love of Khadija radiallahu ta'ala. It's that love that was truly the risk. As for romance, it's a skill. <laughs> Tell me more. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you I mean, should do Why Me Part 2. <laughs> Interesting. You can, you can plan the best, you know, uh, sunset uh, scene and, and do all of that stuff. But like... It doesn't bring you love, man. Inshallah. It doesn't bring you love. If it's not written, if it's not risk for you, you're not going to get it. So just to solve the problem for you guys. I, I, no. I, I appreciate the... Yeah. No. So you do, you do season two of Ramadan. Inshallah. Ah, khair, inshallah. <laughs>
Number three. Let's talk about now that serious I, I, I really want to comment on yes. this, but, but on a serious note. Mm. When you're doing good deeds, you're trying to think about Allah. Right? When you're doing good deeds, you're trying to think about Allah. When you're sinning, you're trying not to think about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The more you think about Allah, the more happiness you will have. The less you think about Allah, the more <laughs> empty you're going to feel. And so one of the things here, just because, you know, obviously the hope part, the, the cure comes much later in this book uh, in regards to these diseases. One of the things here that's just super relevant is that it does tie into the notion of qadr, to the notion of divine decree. The one who knows Allah doesn't need to know his plan. They're content with knowing Allah, right? The one who doesn't know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and is trying to plan their own happiness is going to keep on falling short. And so the headaches will just keep growing. And so there's something really profound to this idea of Allah entrusting you to what you seek other than Him. Wukira ilayhi. Like this is a common uh, theme that we find in the books of Tazkiyah here. That whoever seeks something other than Allah, even if Allah gives it to them, wukira ilayhi. You know what? You're entrusted to that. That's your God now. You want money? Take the money. But money is your God now. You're a slave to that money. So you know what happens? You replace the headache of debt with the headache of wealth. Because you worship money. And so you can never have enough of it. And then you got more headaches because you have wealth. Like I've never seen anyone. And this is maybe like the, the pastoral side, right? The, imam, mm -hmm. the imaming part, right? Have you ever seen anyone that got rich and said, Oh, alhamdulillah, everything's good now. I've never seen anyone who said, I got rich and my headaches, my problems went away in life. No, it, it really did not. So you're seeking refuge in Allah from a Dane, from death. But whoever said, like, I got rich and like, I'm the ha I don't have any problems anymore. Like, I'm, I'm fulfilled now. It doesn't happen. It doesn't. And if someone says it, they're lying to you and they're probably scamming you on social media. All right? <laughs> but it's not real. It's so not real. But the one who does good deeds, like, they're thinking about Allah constantly. So they're connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when things take this turn and that turn, they're looking up to the heavens constantly. Whereas the other person is becoming enslaved to everything of this world that they have pursued religiously in place of their pursuit of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah, Jazakallah Khair Sheikh. Um, adding to the point that I mentioned is point number three that he says over here. He says, Qala rahimahullah ta'ala, also from the ill effects of uh, uh, the sins, Qala wahshatun, يجدها العاصي في قلبه بينه وبين الله. He says, a feeling of desolation, a feeling of estrangement that the person finds in his heart or her heart between him, between her and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Like no matter how much I want to be close to Allah azza wa jal, that sin deprives me from that connection because I feel guilty, I feel not clean, I feel this, I feel that. So all, this is now if we look at it from the, from the positive side, that feeling remorseful and guilty. But if someone start thinking about themselves, well, I'm, I'm too messed up. So this is, therefore, they try to avoid thinking about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because the more you think of Allah azza wa jal, the more you feel obliged that you have to do well. So therefore, what do they do? They try to keep forgetting about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It makes them feel better. Because I want to feel better what I'm do with what I'm doing. It's bad. But I don't want to always feel guilty and feel, you know, trashy and feel this. So you always try to feel not to connect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The consequence of making, committing that sin is just it makes you start trying not to connect with Allah azza wa And that's the opposite of what you're supposed to be doing. He said, rahimahullah ta'ala, qal, that kind of feeling of estrangement and desolation from the heart, la tuwazinuha wa la tuqarinuha laddatun asla. Like you will find absolutely no, nothing, you, can't, you can never find a sweetness in anything sweetness in anything that will bring you or suffice you from, from, from what you missed in that moment right now. He says, Even if you do all the pleasure of this world just to cover that missing part in your heart, which is the connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, all of that stuff can never compare to that missed point in your heart. The opposite of estrangement and loneliness is Allah's presence. In Allah ma'as sabirin. Allah is with the patient. In Allah ma'al muttaqin, ma'al muhsinin. Allah is with the God conscious, with the good doer. So the loneliness that you feel in your sin, that estrangement where you're putting barriers between you and the heavens, no matter what you fill your plate with then, that loneliness will not go away. Mm. But that ma'iyya, 
that ma'iyatun khasa, like you're, you're with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you know that Allah is with you, when you know Allah is with you, then no matter what the circumstances are, you know the one who controls our circumstances. Mm. So you're pleased, right? And that's one of the greatest gifts that's given to a person in sabr, in patience, right? Is that ma'iyya, that, that presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Like, I know Allah is with me. You know, it's like there are so many common things. Like, I know you're, in, if, you know, if you're looking to your corner, as long as this person is there, as long as I look back and I see this person is there, as long as I've got this phone number, as long as I've got this connection, right? I'm okay. Like, imagine if you were in a country and you had the phone number of the president or the head of state and complete authoritarian regime. He says something, it happens. And you know, like, if you get something as simple as a traffic ticket or you get into a major dispute, you can just call that guy up and it's done. You've got him in your corner, right? The person who knows that Allah is with them in Nama'i Rabbi, Sayyahdeen, Allah is with me, He's going to guide me anyway, always sees the power of Allah's presence over the overwhelming circumstances that could otherwise sink someone into despair. Mm -hmm. Right? So the opposite of wahsha is ma'iya, is that is that presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know what he says, Rahimullah he, he actually closes this point by saying, وَلَيْسَ عَلَى الْقَلْبِ أَمَرُّ مِنْ وَحْشَةِ الذَّنْبِ عَلَى الذَّنْبِ فَاللَّهُ الْمُسْتَعَانِ because there is nothing more bitter, like nothing worse on the heart than the estrangement of, of the sin that you've committed, uh, feeling now more estranged by trying to, to ease yourself by committing another sin. Like unfortunately feeling lonely, so we start realizing, well, I'm lonely anyway. And we start doing another one, and then another one. So we start getting deeper and deeper into that estrangement, this that actually loneliness, and being farther away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the worst thing you could do to your heart. Instead of trying to heal it, you're making it worse to yourself. Then come to four, point number four, he says, قال, Another one of those uh, ill effects of the sins, قال, الوحشة, the same thing, that loneliness, that is that isolation from people. So the first thing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, with Allah azza wa ta'ala, between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And now, this is between you and the people. وَلَا سِيَّمَا أَهْلُ الْخَيْرِ مِنْهُمْ فَإِنَّهُ يَجْدُ وَحْشَةً بَيْنَهُ وَبَيْنَهُمْ You always find that kind of, you know, estrangement, estrangement between and them. The desolation feeling between you and the people of, of righteousness. Uh, they said actually it would be from uh, multiple reasons. Number one, you don't feel qualified to be in the presence of the righteous ones. So you convince yourself, and that's what the shaitan convinces you, obviously. Look, these are pure people, righteous ones. You know, who are you? Look at you. You're not going to soil their gathering with your presence. Get out of here. Don't be with them. That's one way of looking at it. And the other one is that knowing that if I'm going to be around them, what's going to happen? They're going to keep reminding me with my mistakes, my fault, my flaws, my errors. So stay away from the people. Either way, you end up being alone and become lonely. And that's where the shaitan start attacking you. As the Prophet says, قال, The wolf preys only on the stray sheep. Naam. SubhanAllah, Shaykh, this idea here, and, and there's a difference between wahsha and ghurba as well, right? Mm. Ghurba is to be a stranger because of your good qualities, right? So you start, you know, either Allah filters you out or you are <laughs> filtered out, right? Either Allah filters you out or you are filtered out. So what that means is that your good qualities cause you to drift away from certain people, the friendships that have to die, Right, that I was talking about yesterday, those relationships that like, you really don't want anything to do with. And that's a good quality. That's a good loneliness to have. But mm. notice, the one who is gharib has who? Who do they have with them? They don't have wahsha with Allah. So they have a full share of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so the consequences, the bitterness of being separated from people doesn't affect them as much. Because they've got Allah to go back to. Whereas the person who has wahsha with Allah and then has wahsha between them and the people, they go down that path of loneliness and despair. And what ends up happening is your sins naturally start to translate to bad character. Mm. You just You become a nasty person. SubhanAllah, how pleasing and blessed is the company of a person who is constantly in the pursuit of the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They're detail-oriented. The way they talk to you, the way they treat you, 
You don't sin when you're, when you're in their presence. You feel their lightness. You feel the gathering is light. You feel good when you're in their presence mm. because they're not burdening you with their, own, with their own baggage. How nasty is the presence of a person who is lost in themselves, right? And so your sins start to, they start to stink. They start to make you reek. And so people will start to drift away from you as well. And that's why I tell people, subhanAllah, when they, you know, when people convert to Islam, they always ask for like that advice. And mashallah, we've had so many people convert to Islam now. So many people. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give them all thabat. May Allah give them all firmness. To the point that it's weird when we don't have someone taking shahada, right? Like in the masjid. Like it's to that point. Like we kind of look around like we got the boxes ready because it's uh, not the boxes to put people in, the boxes to give to people. The embrace box, right? Like, um, but like it's weird, right? But there's always this advice that people ask. And, and the first thing I tell them, I say, listen, the people around you have to see that your Islam makes you such a better character that their skepticism will naturally diminish. We're like, man, you're, you're such a better brother, such a better son, such a better daughter, such a better friend since you became Muslim. Your character has become so much better, oh, no. right? So that's what the knowledge of Allah should do to you. It should make you start thinking about the way that you treat people and the way that you treat your environment. Whereas a person who is ظالمون لنفسي will eventually become ظالمون لغيره as well. A person who wrongs themselves mm -hmm. with sin will eventually wrong others as well. The foulness will come out, the nastiness will come out, and they're just not going to be pleasant people to be around. And that's going to put a distance between them and especially the righteous people. Because the righteous don't want to be around you because you're going to backfight. You're going to gossip. I don't want to hang out with you. I don't want to be in your presence. You're going to start doing this. You're going to start doing that. You're going to start listening to this. You're going to start talking like this. You're going to start, I just don't need that right now. So the righteous will naturally start to make excuses to get away from you. And you don't want that to happen. SubhanAllah, Shaykh. That's what he was also talking about in that, in that actual particular paragraph when he says, قال, وَكُلَّمَا قَوِيَ تِلْكَ الْوَحْشَ بَعُدَ عَنْهُ مِنْ مُجَالَسَتِهِمْ so every time this kind of feeling of estrangement right now, or feeling that wahsha, that, that, that loneliness in the heart, and the, he says that it's become like avoiding the people, people avoiding them, and eventually, you will lose now the barakah of benefiting from these gatherings, from these people, and you start becoming closer with the party of the shaytan, as much as you go farther from the party of Ar-Rahman. Like when you go away from the party of Ar-Rahman, where, where are you heading anyway? There's no other way. But you're getting closer and closer to the party of the shaitan. Because we're social beings, right? Absolutely. So we need, we're, we're going to naturally start forming social circles that speak to our spiritual essence. He right? said, this becomes so strong in the heart until it causes the same effect between you and your wife, your child, your relatives, and even between you and yourself. So you always see them gloomy. Like you'll be sitting there because, subhanAllah, you come back home, even your spouse will recognize that. What's wrong with you? Nothing. Why are you acting with an attitude? I'm not acting with an attitude. You start yelling at each other, subhanAllah, because you know you're guilty. You've done something that if your spouse would find out, it would destroy your marriage probably. Same thing with your child, same thing with your, with your friend. With, so it, it's just, it's always that moment, are they going to find out or not? And subhanAllah, the last point I want to mention here, Sheikhna, is says one of the effects also of the sin that darkness that a person finds in their heart he says like it's real darkness he says what does that mean if you guys remember when we talked about the beginning of the month of Ramadan that the Quran is what the Quran is light it shines it illuminates in your heart that makes your heart alhamdulillah see by the sight of the basira the side of the heart, not the side of the eyes, of course. So you see that. So when you commit these sins, uh, this is just like a barrana ala qulubihim ma kanu yaksibun. The residues, the, 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 the dust of the sin starts falling on your heart slowly and gradually until that dust becomes what? Layers. And it solidifies. And then the heart becomes what? That is it. Lost access to the light. So whenever you make decisions, you just not making the right decisions. Even at work, like people lose their jobs because their akhlaq are bad. Their attention is not where it's supposed to be. Instead of making their attention to make their job right, you just want to make uh, friends with the people who will take them to the haram places, for example. So mm -hmm. their focus is not where it's supposed to be. Their heart is messed up. It's not seeing the way, and therefore it makes the bad decision. And that's what he had. 
قال فتصير ظلمة المعصية لقلبي كالظلمة الحسية لبصره. That darkness in the heart, just like the complete blindness in your sight. ماذا رزالت؟ قال أم وبالتالي تقوى هذه الظلمة حتى تظهر ثم تقوى تظهر في العين ثم تقوى حتى على في الوجه وتصير سوادا في مراه كل أحد. Like it starts showing on you. People they see that. And that, 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 that the shining light of the heart is no longer there, it's missing. And, and, and always, whenever they make choices, make decisions, unfortunately, always going after their desires. So, Sheikh, to give the hopeful part here, no. the opposite of this, right? Because there's barakah that's divinely sort of, like you can think of the blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that just kind of lands from the sky, and then you can think of the barakah that's cultivated from within. You can think of the consequence of sin that kind of like lands from the sky, and then you can think of the long-term one that kind of cultivates from within. Barakah, blessing, and yara al-kathir fil qalil, that you always see a lot in a little, right? So what, what type of behavior does that inspire in you? What type of behavior does that, when you see a little, when you always see a lot in, in, in a little, what type of behavior does that inspire in you? Gratitude, right? And one of the best ways to have a good relationship is when you see a lot in a little. So you see one good quality in your spouse and you extol it. You extol the good quality, right? Whereas a person who is, that darkness is there and darkness is settling in the heart, they see all the horrible things and they exaggerate the bad and they diminish the good. Whereas baraka. Right? You're not just seeing like when the Prophet ﷺ says, وَبَارِكْ لِي فِي مَا رَزَقْتَنِي Bless me in what you have given me as risk. Romance is risk. Hub is risk, right? It's all risk. But give me, give me the blessing and what it is. Romance is a skill. <laughs> all right, fine, Shaykh. We'll, we'll have to agree to disagree here. <laughs> but like when the Prophet ﷺ says, give me barakah in what I own. He's not saying increase the square footage. He's saying increase my lens towards the square footage. Mm. When the Prophet ﷺ is asking for barakah, in everything that he has. So in your relationships, I think that one of the, the, the problems that we see today, and you know, subhanAllah, it's, it's true, like it's, by the way, husband and wife with each other, I see a lot of this, right? It's like you diminish everything in the other, in, in your spouse. You diminish them. Like you mention all the bad things. I've never seen any good from you, right? No, baraka. Just like gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you see something small and you extol it and that hamd allows it to increase, that praise allows it to increase. In your relationships as well, when there's barakah, you see goodness in people. You see goodness in things. So you see the barakah in that person and you extol the good and you praise it. So what it does is it reinforces it and that person wants to act on that good more. Otherwise, you keep exaggerating the bad and ignoring the good, that person just shuts down and says, you know what, why be good in the first place? Why should I even try to show you a good quality? You never appreciate it anyway. And so it just darkens the whole house, right? In our friendships as well. Like, no one likes a narcissist. No one likes a sociopath. No one likes a person that always sort of sees the favors that they do for you, but they don't see the favors you do for them. No one likes that type of a person. That breeds arrogance. It breeds, it becomes a very off-putting type of personality. But don't you love that friend that you give them a small gift and they thank you for it as if you just gave them the best gift in the world? What does that breed in that relationship? Something pleasant. And it's genuine because that person has light. And that light, it's like, you know, subhanAllah, you know, there's something small. If the lights were off right now, you wouldn't be able to see that. But with the lights on, you can see it. You see something so small. When the lights go on, the light of the heart, you start to see little good things all around you and you constantly appreciate them. So it grows and it grows and it grows and it grows. And that makes you a person that other people would, would want to be around. And that was the beauty of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi SubhanAllah, like, it, it's often hard when you think of like someone who's, who's so great. How can someone who's so great see the greatness in something so small? Like the Prophet ﷺ is a man who has perfect character, right? Those are things that can breed arrogance. If you have everything, right, that kamal, in, in, you know, in so many different ways, that completion, that perfection, so many different ways. But the Prophet ﷺ would appreciate the smallest things, the smallest things, right? 
So barakah is to see a lot in a little, and it breeds nothing but the, but the gratitude of Allah in return, as well as the gratitude of people and goodness. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant that to us all. Amen, Ya Rabbi. Jazakallah khashay. We'll take a few questions, inshallah ta'ala here. Um, I was wondering on what your thoughts are on how men these days are unable to approach women face to face, but choose to approach them online. How would you recommend approaching this issue right now? You talked about romance, man. Yeah, deal with it. Um, They're pursuing their risk right now, according yeah, to your definition of it. Don't pursue your risk through people's DMs, please. <laughs> Stay out of people's DMs. No, no risk pursuits through DMs, all right? Go, no. through, go through the right way, inshallah ta'ala. Look, I will say this, and, and, and by the way, let me, let me be very serious about this, because I actually was going to, I actually was going to talk about this um, when that whole thing came out. Like, Individual problems should not be a scapegoat for community failure. We mm. failed those communities. The fact that these marriage apps are horrendous, the fact that people act so terribly, the fact that people don't have avenues to pursue marriage in, in a right way, in a, in a principled way, and the fact that we haven't created that as communities and made the way for it and given people not just the instruction but the structure is a community failure and it's something that we need to work on. But that doesn't, so that doesn't excuse the community, like individual bad behavior doesn't excuse the community failure and community failure doesn't excuse your individual failure to go about things in the haram way because the community has failed um, try your best honestly and look the internet is so fake everything about it's fake it's a constant advertisement right everyone gives you a version of themselves that they're advertising all right so, not through the pictures, not through the words. So fake. Chef, so, we don't even advertise the marriage material stuff. That's no. the problem. Like, with all the respect for the brothers and sisters, you know, when you reach each other, you know, online. Uh, I mean, what exactly attracted, to the, to, attracted you to this person in the first place that made you go and send them a message? Is it because you saw that, mashallah, she has the amazing quality of a wife, amazing quality of a mother, Amazing quality of a righteous woman. Or is it because she's beautiful? Her, uh, you know, uh, her posts are funny, blah, blah, blah. Same thing about the guy. What really made you just be prompted to send a message to this guy, for example? Because, because he's cute? That doesn't make him a good husband, by the way, just to let you know, Yanni. So therefore, uh, it's extremely important for people to understand, you will find a lot of options out there on the internet. But are they really marriage material? You need to be careful with your choices. And, and I'll put this sort of in the, in the absence, again, of community structure. Um, brothers and sisters, those of you that can actually, like, serve in your own personal circles, inshallah ta'ala, to help. I'm, I'm not recommending everyone get into the matchmaker game, right? But part of the community is, like, we try to create avenues, inshallah ta'ala, like, hey, you know, you know you're extended in your extended network. There's this person who might be a good match for this person. Try to facilitate that for people when you see that, especially on the basis of deen and good character. And I hope, inshallah ta'ala, that as we're maturing in so many ways institutionally, um, mm -hmm. as a community, that we hopefully rise to better ways. But I'm just saying, like, be careful with the internet. Be super careful. It's, um, yeah. All that's, never, a, all, that's a, all that's a tangent, but I think it's a very important subject. I want also to add to it one more thing. Yeah. I personally believe one of the biggest problems that we have in our society, especially with the younger generation, as they approach each other directly for the purpose of marriage, is unfortunately, unfortunately, we lack the strong skill of being decisive and making decisions. True. So we end up in a constant browsing mode. You always look at this girl and this girl and this guy and this guy and this guy, but we are not brave enough to say, I will take the risk and marry this person. Obviously, you might say, but some people did that before, and look what happened to them. Well, you're different. You're not supposed to get married and making sure that you're not going to make failure an option. So the idea is that we're fortunate we keep this pushing our, our decision to marry, you know, so far that we end up just becoming completely, uh, um, I don't know, it just becomes like a, a, a Photoshop. You want to create that, that vision of a person. And hopefully one day we'll, we'll find that match in but, your but, life. But Sheikh, for the sake of the book too, no. and connecting to it, just to connect to the southern, I hope 
by no means, by the way, is what we're saying comprehensive. Like we got to go deeper course, into this subject, course. inshallah. And hopefully, in, in after Ramadan, we can actually uh, have some maybe some deeper discussions on this, inshallah. Maybe we can maybe we can make that a community discussion, inshallah. inshallah it's something that's been on my heart and my mind. Just know that just for the sake of the material we're reading, nothing good will ever come out of displeasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Period. Yeah. Just yeah. know that. Like, no barakah. You won't have barakah. You're not going to pursue something in haram and then make it right. Um, the barakah won't be there. So I know a lot of people just think to themselves, I started off, yeah, we'll, we'll go down this path, but then it'll, be, it'll all be all right because we'll just show up in the masjid, we'll do a nikah, it'll be done, we'll move on. You can't play God like that. You just can't. So... There's a difference between, by the, even when two people, by the way, have messed up, and, and I want to put this out there, because I know it's Ramadan, and I know a lot of people are actually, like, you got this relationship hanging in the balance, and maybe you, you're not texting over the last 10 nights, or you're putting it on hold for the last 10 nights. Look, um, seriously, you know, and people will be like, all right, we want to make this right. You want to make it right? Both of you turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala separately, repent, and then after you clear your senses, clean your slate with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, come back, then pursue things in the halal way if you still think it's a good idea at that point. But it's not like just the, all right, you know, let's just seal the deal and let's. No, it's, you got to do things the right way. There's no barakah in that. So I implore you to not get caught up in the deception of, of the devil, the deception of shaitan, talbis iblis. That makes you think that anything good will ever come out of displeasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even if it's temporary pleasure, it'll catch up to you if it doesn't have that sincere repentance, that sincere inflection point. And I implore us as a community, right? We have to do better, inshallah ta'ala, to make things easier for people to facilitate something like this, inshallah ta'ala, in halal ways. And so I think what has to happen, Shaykh, is that you have to have community models that no. allow for people within communities to, to find, uh, you know, inshallah, that match to where it's not just this disastrous, uh, superficial, you know, world no. anymore. I, mean, Allah make I it just want to put it out there because actually, alhamdulillah, at BRIC, we have monthly, <coughs> monthly workshops. So uh, last year we did it all on parenting. This year we did actually alternating one parenting workshop, one workshop on marriage. So we talked about, you know, uh, premarital issues, people when they get married, difficulties, these things and so on. So alhamdulillah, we, we're opening the door for people to come and learn. We just need our young men and women to really to learn and, and have that, that profound knowledge, not just having the information about how marriage really works. Unfortunately, a lot of it is, comes because we don't even know how marriage works. We're only thinking about what? Our thinking of marriage ends with the, with the, uh, with the wedding night, and that's it. What comes after that, we have no clue. So the last thing we think about when it comes to getting married is the photo shoot. That's it. What comes after that, it's still, we wait for it to happen, inshallah. Sure, you got a lot of like social media clippable things in this talk, man. I don't know. Uh. <laughs> You're inspired tonight, mashallah. You're like dropping these little gems. Really, mashallah. Yeah, yeah. So I'm just going to give you a little bit of social media knowledge. If someone comments and said, Sheikh ate, uh -huh. that doesn't mean that you broke your fast. <laughs> it don't mean that you ate. It means that you, you, were, you, were, you were speaking Words of wisdom, Shaykh. Huh? <laughs> well, here's the thing, though. Well, yeah. Because you have more following, so <laughs> since you're wearing the same outfit like mine right now, we can just take a clip of you speaking and my voice over, inshallah ta'ala. Deal. So, a question here comes, and it's a very sincere, serious question, saying, right. does sincere repentance help negate these effects of sins? So, I've, I admit it. I've done this, I've done that. And I realize, subhanAllah, I'm deprived of ilm and my life is messed up. I can make decisions because my heart is dark. It's just sincere repentance will help me ro overcome and recover from this? So part of sincere repentance is accepting the consequences of your sin. Okay? Mm. Um, you know, like when you got to get a stain out of your heart, sometimes you need to, there's a grinding there. There has to be some way of coming back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it may be as a means of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala purifying you from that sin that there are worldly consequences that remain from that sin. But, the one who repents from sin is like the one who did not sin. That there doesn't remain any of the afterlife consequences if your repentance was sincere. Mm. So when you sincerely turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there may be, as part of that repentance, some worldly consequences, some things that happen that bring you to the next step of your journey. Adam alayhi salam, did Allah forgive him? Did. did Allah forgive him? Yes. Allah Adam Rabbihi Kanimat Fataba Ali. Allah forgave him right away. But Adam still had to come to earth. He still had hundreds of years of regretting what he did. 
he still faced the consequence in a worldly sense, right? So it's going to happen sometimes that, look, it's, you, you, you got yourself in a hole. No. Once you looked up to the heavens and said, Ya Allah, I want to get out of this hole. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala welcomes you back. But the climb is going to be a little bit difficult sometimes. So the effect in terms of the worldly effect, yeah, it will remain. But inshallah ta'ala, the afterlife, um, you know, the akhirah, this is the husn al in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No. Arju Allah wa akhaf of them. No. I, I hope in Allah and then I, I fear my sin. I believe Allah is so merciful. And I know it, like that I could say astaghfirullah after living a life of major sin and oh Allah, I want to turn back to you. And Allah would say, I forgive you and I don't care anymore. La ubali, it's gone. No. But then I also know that there is a process of growth that has to come out of that sin. And no. so that's where it is. So don't, don't doubt your repentance, but also accept the journey that comes with that repentance. Sheikh, I think there's a confusion about a statement that they heard from this conversation today. Sure. Maybe it needs to clarify. The sadness of missing out on committing a sin is worse than committing the sin itself. But I thought we don't get punished for sins we don't commit. So what Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah is speaking about is what it represents of the heart. So it's not that Allah will punish you. By the way, there's a, there is a, a, a specific point. Maybe, Shaykh, you can comment on this. You know the hadith where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi mentioned Sallam. that whoever wants to commit a sin but does not actually commit the sin, then Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala will not write down the sin for them. That there's a difference that the ulama make between someone who repented along the way and then a good deed will actually be recorded for them. So they were going to commit the sin and then they stopped themselves and someone who is stopped by circumstance. So Imam Nawi rahimahullah comments on this actually and other scholars and they say that, look, the one who was stopped by circumstance, you might as well have committed the sin. That's not the same thing. Like your car broke down on the way to the concert. You didn't, br that's not the same as turning around and going home, right? And saying astaghfirullah at that point then you don't have to worry about the sin of going. In fact, you have a good deed for turning around. But if your car just broke down, you don't get to claim the credit for that. So the sadness of having missed out represents the emptiness of the heart, the poverty of the soul. And that's what he's saying, diagnose the disease. It's not like the sin is necessarily recorded every time you think, oh, I wish I wasn't, I wish I could have done this. I wish it wasn't haram to do this. No, you're not gonna get, a sin is not going to be recorded when you go, I wish it wasn't haram to do this inside of your head or in your heart. But that represents then that you haven't yet tasted the sweetness of faith if you're still thinking that way, mm. right? So that's what it represents, I think, Allahu Alam. So if someone says like, uh, Alhamdulillah, I, I repented from the thing that I've done before and I'm very confident that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, hopefully Allah will forgive me for that. But uh, I've heard people around me and they're unable to forgive me. How do I deal with this? Like, well, I, I, can, I can deal with the issue that having hope in Allah to accept my repentance, but I can't see these people willing to forgive me as much as Allah is, is forgiving me. Yeah. Look, um, by the way, I'm, I'm going to say this, subhanAllah, that uh, the, the series for this year, the Why Me series, right, was a lot of these questions, like the way that I wanted to think about it when it was coming up was like literally mm. the questions you ask yourself at different points in your life. And usually when you get a little bit older, you realize like, man, I hurt, I hurt some people. Like I wasn't always the victim like I thought I was. There were people that I hurt as well. Like I exceeded. That's part of maturity. Sometimes it's spiritual maturity too, right? Like, okay, I, I messed up a few times. At that point, there are two paths. Number one is seeking forgiveness from the person. Number two is restoring what you took from them to the extent that you can, right? So if you hurt them, and there are ways to restore that. It's like it's interesting the way the ulama think about this so wholesomely, like backbiting. Okay, you, you, you slandered someone in a gathering. Okay, let's say that you slandered someone in a gathering. And then, two weeks later or sometime later, you realize that that slander was wrong and you want to go to that person and apologize. Don't just go to the person and apologize. You got to go clear the slander with the people that you slandered that person with, right? And by the way, this is what makes social media so dangerous. It makes it so dangerous because once you put it out there, in the internet world, you can't take it back. It's very hard to take it back at that point. Travel's too far, and Allah will hold you accountable for it. So be careful. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ says, and yet That it's enough of a lie for a person to simply repeat what they hear. Because you, you, there's inevitably going to be some lies that you pumped into the, into the world of, of online, and you let it go. And that's, that's your fault. That's between you and Allah. 
but to the extent of restoration being possible, you should restore what you took. You took someone's honor, you should try to restore their honor. You took someone's wealth, you should try to restore the damages of taking their wealth. You hurt someone, seek their forgiveness, seek forgiveness from Allah for hurting them, try to restore. And I'll say subhanAllah and in, in conclusion with this, this is what makes, I think, uh, the time that we live in, which is, it's not as simple as it used to be during these times. The time of everything being magnified so quickly, this is what makes it so dangerous. You put something out there into the world, the hurt is 10 x or 10,000 10, x <laughs> right? In ways that just weren't possible in these pre-modern societies. Like this type of stuff didn't exist this way that you could slander someone to 100,000 people you don't even know in a matter of minutes. You could flaunt your sin to a million people you don't even know in a matter of minutes. You could damage someone that you never actually meet in real life from miles and miles away. Like this didn't exist in pre-modern society. And so that should simply mean like, Ya Allah, I'm turning back to you and I'm going to change my ways. And that's the last part of that. Change your behavior. Change your behavior. And this is part of if you hurt someone, if you hurt people in the past with a certain spiritual disease, make sure that you never treat anyone else that Allah puts in your path with that disease ever again. Make sure you never harm with that again. Learn your lesson with the other people that Allah is going to put in your life now. If you realize that you messed up with the people in the past, and there's always a path back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we ask Allah to guide us to that and to forgive us. Ameen, Ya Rabbi. Ameen. Jazakumullah khair for uh, being here with us this evening. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us some of those who listen to the speech and follow the best of it, Ya Rabbil Alameen. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us among those who always maintain healthy tawbah, return back to Allah Azza wa Jal. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to increase us in ilm and knowledge that is beneficial to us and make us benefit from the knowledge that we learn. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to continue to send his blessings upon us and not and never deprive us of his of the risk because of our sins our mistakes our shortcomings we ask allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to illuminate and shine our heart with the light of guidance ya rabbil alameen we ask allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us among those when they do they do that which is most pleasing to him subhanahu wa ta'ala we ask allah azza wa jal to make it easy on our brothers and sisters in gaza ya rabbil alameen we ask allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to strengthen their iman we ask allah azza wa jal to confirm their iman in their hearts ya rabbil alameen we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to alleviate their sufferings, protect them and shield them and provide for them from sources that no one knows, Ya Rabbil Alameen. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to deliver them the victory that He promised, Ya Allah, Ya Rabbil Alameen. And the way we all gather in this place, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that one day we will all gather together in Jannah al Firdaus al A'la, ala surur mutaqabilin, with the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh.